And this good news of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. The fact is, his only true name, Yahweh, was obscured for centuries, while the incorrect substitute, Jehovah, was mistakenly put in its place. We find here that it was Paul's manner to worship on the seventh day, Sabbath. There is only one way to be just in Scripture, and it happens through obedience to the Father, and that means His commands and His laws. If there is any one truth that we must understand about the Messiah, it is His heritage. Yahweh saw something in you that He can use. And so he called you as a candidate for everlasting life. He told him that his son's name would be called Yahshua because he would save his people from their sins. When you understand that the New Testament is an extension of the Old Testament, welcome to Discover the Truth. As we all know, myths and legends can take on a life of their own and often have the appearance of fact. A common legend is that George Washington threw a silver dollar across the Potomac River, even though silver dollars did not exist at the time and the Potomac was a mile wide. Or how about Paul Revere's famous ride from Boston to Lexington shouting, the British are coming. The legend makes no sense in light of the fact that most people living in Massachusetts at that time considered themselves British. Bible beliefs today are awash in myths and beliefs that grew and flourished over the centuries and yet are nowhere found in its pages. Considering how these wild fables involving George Washington and Paul Revere became generally accepted in the course of only a few hundred years, imagine what can happen after a couple thousand years when it comes to Bible folklore and belief. Have you ever wondered why the typical paintings of a Hebrew Messiah show an individual with Western European features, including a narrow nose, blue eyes, and long golden hair? Have you ever looked at illustrations in old Bibles depicting various biblical scenes and wondered why these ancient Israelites of the Middle East are all wearing clothing of Renaissance Italy, 1,500 miles away and 1,500 years into the future? These characterizations are just small examples of how time, tradition, and foreign belief systems have seriously altered the way the Bible is portrayed today. Perceptions sometimes deviate so far from the truth that for the sake of accuracy, we must stop and take a serious look at what we have been told or believe. Today on Discover the Truth, we will look at some popular Bible misconceptions about the Old and New Testaments and see how they compare with what the Scriptures actually say. Now, you may want to fasten your seatbelt. It could be a rather bumpy ride. Most of our society looks at the Bible through westernized Greco-Roman filters rather than in the light of the native Hebraic language and culture. This problem has proved so stealthy and persistent through the millennia that most never give it a second thought. And they also don't realize what's at risk. Until you realize that the New Testament is part of the old, with a few key revisions, you will not understand it properly. Also coming down this path are many doctrinal disparities, which were shaped by cultures and practices of people who came later. As a result, truth suffered significantly. Blinded by faulty teachings, many don't recognize the truth, even when it's presented clearly and plainly. Let's dispel the first issue we raised regarding the Savior. The Messiah, Yahshua, being a Jew with a Hebrew name, never had his portrait done by an artist or sculptor. Even if some were around at the time, he never would have posed for them. No one today knows what he looked like. Scripture doesn't offer any description except to indicate that he was average in appearance, had shorter hair, Ezekiel 44, 20, and a beard in Isaiah 50, verse 6. He looked so much like any other Hebrew of his day that he could pass through a crowd of Jews unrecognized. If the Bible had provided a description of his appearance, many would create and worship his image rather than concentrate on what he said and did. 
Well, many do that regardless, focusing entirely on his person and overlooking his primary teaching about a coming kingdom and the part the chosen can have in it. Our Savior was certainly no weak and frail European, but a rugged Hebrew craftsman who worked with wood and stone. Being that his mother was Jewish, he had the typical dark, curly, Mideast hair and features that reflected years of hard work and ministry carried out in the open elements and hot sun of the Middle East. But this is only the tip of a very large iceberg. Anomalies concerning the simplest biblical facts underscore the work of the adversary to derail both a correct understanding of biblical truth as well as the proper worship that would naturally flow from it. To understand the harmony of both testaments, we must connect the dots instead of driving a wedge between them. One of the major barriers to arriving at a correct understanding of Yahweh's Word is the simple fact that the Western world looks at the Bible through Western eyes. In actuality, the Bible is a book about Middle Eastern peoples known as Israel and their Hebrew beliefs in a mighty one named Yahweh. This fact applies to the New Testament as well as the Old and is basic to realizing what happened in the first several hundred years of the New Testament. The plain fact is that the New Testament body of believers was still Hebraic in thinking and behavior. It was something the third century Romanized church wanted to move away from. Almost from the beginning, this emerging universal church became entrenched in Greco-Roman trappings. That they had inherited a Jewish Messiah was an inescapable fact, and it was his Hebraic roots that the early church would seek to suppress any way they could. To distance their worship from its Israelite origins, another Sabbath day was created. Biblical holy days, which were seen as Old Testament obligations meant only for ancient Israel, were replaced by celebrations that would become predominantly secular over time. Passover was morphed into a celebration of His resurrection. New Testament writings of Hebrews like Matthew, Mark, Paul, and Peter were given a different spin to support an array of new doctrines, some of which reflected the teachings of Greek philosophers. Apostolic writings were ripped from their Israelite framework and force-fitted into a European culture and mindset. The apostles are made to look almost as if they wrote their books and letters on the steps of Roman basilicas. Over time, a vast gulf would develop between original biblical truth and modern beliefs. The pivotal question becomes, is the New Testament a Hebrew book, a Greek work, a Latin volume, or a hopeless mixture, and what difference does it make? Even Bible students with only a basic understanding of Scripture know that Hebrew is the language of the Old Testament's manuscripts. It's the language found in the ancient manuscripts of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the oldest Bible in existence. But what about the New Testament? The common belief is that the New Testament was originally written in Greek simply because Greek is the language of the oldest available manuscripts of the New Testament. Well, by the same token, however, the Greek text also was the oldest available text of the Old Testament until the Dead Sea Scrolls, written in Hebrew, were discovered in 1947. We have much more for you. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Many have misconceptions about who the Messiah really was and what he taught. From his physical appearance to the name he was known and called by, popular beliefs about the greatest figure in human history hold many fabrications and inaccuracies. Was he born on December 25th, the same day revered by sun worshippers for centuries before his birth? What was the method of his death? Did he do away with biblical law? Did he have brothers and sisters? Why did he come to earth? Find out why the most revered figure in history has so many misconceptions surrounding him. Peel away centuries of ancient Greek and Roman influence and look at the Messiah from the proper perspective of his Hebraic upbringing and culture. To understand the Hebrew roots of the Messiah is to unlock who he really is. Request our free booklet, The True Messiah. Call now. Operators are standing by. Dial 1-573-896-1000. That number again is 1-573-896-1000. Or write to Discover the Truth, P.O. Box 463, Holt Summit, Missouri, 
65043. Read and request on our website, yrm.org. For an evening of amazing scriptural insight, join host Randy Foliard in Kentucky at the Lexington Public Library Northside Branch on June 18th at 7 p.m. and in Tennessee at the Brentwood Library on June 19th at 7 p.m. Refreshments will be served. For those interested in baptism, please contact the ministry at 573-896-1000 prior to the seminar. For more information about upcoming seminars, visit us online, yrm.org, or on Facebook, search Yahweh's Restoration Ministry. Welcome back. The popular notion today is that the Bible is a book with a first section composed in Hebrew, teaching an archaic Hebrew religion, and a New Testament section composed in Greek with teachings and beliefs that reflect Western European culture and values. And so in the minds of many, the New Testament included Jews who were in the process of switching from their Israelite faith to Grecianized beliefs and language. Along with that was a tacit belief that Paul, the major New Testament writer, was a Hellenist Jew from Tarsus who wrote his letters specifically to Greek-speaking assemblies in Asia Minor and the Mediterranean region, ostensibly to convert them to a new religion. This has worked to the advantage of those who want to keep the Old and New Testament separated and not viewed as a continuum of truth. As we read in Philippians chapter 3, verse 5, which is part of Paul's autobiography, let us ask ourselves whether cutting the New Testament away from the Old is proper, or yet another erroneous idea that has taken on the status of fact. Paul writes about himself, "...circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, an Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee." Paul's own expression, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, is a Hebrew idiom that means a Hebrew through and through, in thinking, attitude, language, and life. Paul, whose actual name was the Hebrew Shaul, the King James also calls him Saul, was in fact a consummate Hebrew. And for his politics, Paul was a Pharisee, a prominent sect of Judaism. Paul also grew up in Jerusalem, which was the center of Pharisaic Judaism. Now, at this point, you might be saying, yes, I realize that Paul may have been a Hebrew, but he was educating various Greek-speaking churches through the Greek language. In reality, Scripture reveals that Paul's letters or epistles were written to various groups of the Jewish dispersion. Each group or assembly he founded contained a core of Jews along with others, including Gentiles. The Hebrews among them would then transmit the biblical teaching from Paul's letters to the Gentiles in their circle. Note what one authority writes. We must not forget that Christianity grew out of Judaism. The Pauline epistles were letters written by Paul to small messianic congregations in Asia Minor, Greece, and Rome. These early believers were mostly Jews of the dispersion, men and women of Hebrew origin. The epistles were translated into Greek for the use of converts who spoke Greek. This is from the Holy Bible from the Peshitta by George Lamza. Incidentally, Greek gods were worshipped by the Greeks in Greek temples. These temples were later repurposed into churches. Many of the old Roman basilicas, which were public buildings in ancient Rome, were also appropriated for use as churches beginning in the 4th century. An example of how Paul ministered first to the Hebrew-speaking Jewish element wherever he went is found in Acts chapter 17. Here Paul and Silas come to Thessalonica where there is a synagogue of the Jews. In verse 2 we read, 
And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. Now, why did he go specifically to the synagogue on three consecutive Sabbath days, no less, if he was not interested in teaching the Jews the truth of the Savior? Paul was a Jew, and as a Jew, he kept and taught Seventh-day worship, as well as Yahweh's seven annual feast days. He continued doing so even after being instructed and trained by the resurrected Messiah, showing us that nothing in that regard changed with the death of the Savior. The law was still in effect. Another example is his letter to the assembly at the Greek city of Corinth in 1 Corinthians 10, where Paul talks about our fathers who were in the exodus from Egypt, meaning their Israelite forefathers. Repeatedly, we find that Paul went to the synagogue on the Sabbath where both Jews and Gentiles were worshiping, and he never told them to stop doing so. Also critical to our understanding is the question, which books did Paul teach from? The only books in existence at the time were what were known as the Scriptures, the Old Testament. This is highly significant because it is the Apostle Paul who is a preeminent author of the New Testament teachings, after the Savior himself, of course. He taught from the Old Testament, the only Bible in existence. The Old Testament was a Hebrew collection of books about Hebrew people, not Greeks or Romans, but about Israelites and their faith. Notice what he said in Acts chapter 24 and verse 14. But this I confess unto you, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship by the Elohim of my fathers, believing all things that are written in the law and in the prophets. The word heresy here refers to a body of men following their own tenets, as in a sect or a party. But continuing to teach from the Old Testament for a foundation for their New Testament worship, Paul made some people very uncomfortable. Some even went so far as to call his ministry a heresy, or in the modern vernacular, a cult, for teaching the Law and the Prophets, which is another way of saying the Old Testament Scriptures. In addition, Paul included in his ministry and writings what he had learned from the resurrected Messiah, Yahshua. Obviously, Paul saw no contradiction with combining fundamental Old Testament truth with what Yahshua had revealed for the New Testament worshiper. Yahshua himself confirmed in Matthew 5.17 that he didn't come to destroy the law of the prophets, but to fulfill or live out the Old Testament scriptures in obedience to his father. But Paul had critics coming at him from the other side, too. In Acts 24, 5, he's being accused by the religious establishment of being a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, or the followers of the Savior of Nazareth. So he was getting it from both ends, those who thought the Old Testament was obsolete, and those who did not want to hear about New Testament teachings of our Savior, Yahshua. Clearly, Paul harmonized Old and New Testament doctrines in his writings, being that he was directed to do so by the risen Savior, his approach is proper for us today. Well, we have one more break. Stay tuned and we'll be right back. To understand the Word like never before, order your copy of the Restoration Study Bible today. This unique resource provides insight into the Hebrew and Greek texts with over 7,000 footnotes, Strong's numbering, and the Strong's dictionaries. Corey wrote us and said, got mine last week, and I love it. I highly recommend the RSB. Kathy says, it's awesome. We are truly blessed to have all this in one study Bible and with the Strong's references. Thank you for helping me learn Yahweh's Word in a deeper way. Can't wait to show my friends and those in my congregation. To receive your own Restoration Study Bible, order online at wirem.org Bible or by credit card Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Central Time by calling 573-896-1000. To keep this amazing resource affordable, we are offering it for the low price of $25 plus shipping and handling. The RSB will open your eyes to truths that you have never seen before, so order yours today. Welcome back. Paul, the preeminent writer of the New Testament, based his teachings on, first of all, the Old Testament scriptures. In 2 Timothy 3.16, he told the young Timothy, All scripture is given by inspiration of Yahweh and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, 
for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of Yahweh may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All scripture refers specifically here to the Old Testament and only later would include the New Testament once the New Testament was written. How did it come about that two major but divergent world religions exist with one supposedly based in the Old Testament and the other ostensibly founded on the New Testament? If the Old and New Testaments teach the same basic truths, why the dichotomy? Is the Bible designed as two separate books, revealing one way of faithful obedience for Hebrews and another for simple faith for today's believer? One fact is crystal clear. Yahweh said He doesn't change in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6. His design for salvation is the same from the beginning. Through command and through His writers, Yahweh instructed His people to obey Him. Yet many believe that Yahweh's laws must have been given to Israel by mistake, a great error committed by the Father that Yahshua corrected by purging Yahweh's statutes in this age of grace. Hebrews chapter 11 tells us about law-observant Hebrew patriarchs who will be in the coming kingdom because of their faithful obedience. So why will Yahweh specifically reward them for their faithfulness to the law if obedience is unnecessary and irrelevant for salvation? If Paul in the New Testament were teaching a Grecianized faith, why did he teach from a Hebrew Old Testament? Why did he use lessons about Old Testament Israelites, for example, in 1 Corinthians 10? if today's worship is under an entirely different system based on faith alone. In fact, none of the apostles ever heard of the terms Old Testament and New Testament. The first use of the term New Testament is by the theologian Tertullian more than a century after the death of the apostles. Friends, the simple truth is that Paul upheld Old Testament precepts. He wrote, do we then make void the law through faith? Yahweh forbid, yea, we establish the law. Romans chapter 3, verse 31. Something is clearly amiss if we believe that the New Testament teaches a whole new system of faith and conduct disconnected from the Old Testament roots. Yahshua himself upheld, even amplified, the necessity to obey his father Yahweh. Read Matthew 5, from 17 to the end of the chapter. In that passage, he starts out with, Think not that I have come to destroy the law of the prophets. Yahshua himself taught from the Old Testament. He quoted the, the law books of Torah some 60 times. There are nearly 700 individual citations from the books of the Old Testament found in the New Testament. If you include references to the Old Testament, as well as quotations of it in the New, the number would be over 4,000 according to the Expositor's Bible Commentary. The Messiah Yahshua in John 10.35 says, Scripture cannot be broken. And yet for 2,000 years, continuing efforts have been made to break the New Testament away from the Old Testament. Claiming that the New Testament was written in Greek has the effect of disconnecting it from its foundational Hebraic roots. An abundance of internal evidence points clearly to the unavoidable conclusion that the New Testament was originally written in the Hebrew language and was translated into Greek only later. This fact alone provides the essential tie that binds Israelite worship in the Old Testament with the faith of spiritual Israel of the New Testament. Paul says in Romans 11 that the believer today is grafted into that same Israelite covenant promise given in the Old Testament. He wrote in Romans chapter 11, verse 25, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. Paul writes that both believing Israelite and believing Gentile will receive the reward of salvation confirming the continuity from Old to New Testaments. Now let's look at the text itself. If the New Testament writings were originally Greek, then we could reasonably expect to find an occasional Greek word surviving in English from the Greek original. Yet what we find often is many Hebrew words and expressions in the New Testament that have survived into the English. 
That's because the Greek had no word to convey certain Hebrew words and expressions when the Hebrew New Testament text was translated into the Greek from there and then into English. For example, we find in the King James New Testament and other versions the purely Hebraic Aramaic words Abba, which means dearest father, Messiah means anointed one, Sabbath, repose, desist from exertion. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, ma'el, ma'el, why have you forsaken me? Talitha kumi, meaning made arise, mammon, meaning riches, and hosanna, savior, we beseech. Now, if I were translating a book from German to English, would I throw some Russian words into my English translation? Russian words would get into my English version only if the original was being translated from Russian. So finding Hebrew words and expressions coming from purely Greek manuscripts is strong evidence that the original was Hebrew and not Greek. Also scattered throughout the New Testament, we find many Hebrew and Aramaic idioms, which are expressions that cannot be translated well in the Greek, so they were left virtually untranslated. They make perfect sense in the Hebrew, but not in Greek or in English, for that matter. Such expressions include, if your eye is evil, Matthew 6.23, let the dead bury their dead, Matthew 8.22, and you shall heap coals of fire on his head, Romans 12.20. Many other examples show clear evidence that the New Testament was originally a Hebrew work that only later was translated into Greek. And remember, when Yasha returns, his feet will not stand upon Mount Olympus on the Grecian coast or in one of the seven hills of Rome, but on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. And he's coming to redeem Israel. That's all the time we have. We're glad you join us and stay tuned next time as we bring another Discover the Truth. For today's free offer, call now. Operators are standing by. Dial 1-573-896-1000 or write to the address on your screen. Request online by visiting one of the most extensive religious websites on the internet, yrm.org. Donate by credit card by calling during regular office hours, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Central Time, or give online, donate.yrm.org. For a one-time yearly donation of $25 or more, we would like to send you a gift, a one-year subscription to our bi-monthly Restoration Times magazine. This magazine will unlock Bible truth that will simply amaze you. For more information or to read online, visit restorationtimes.org. Get your copy of the Restoration Study Bible, the only Bible like it in the world, by calling during regular office hours or by visiting restorationstudybible.com. This one-of-a-kind amazing resource will quickly become your Bible of choice. Join us next week as we take a journey of understanding, walking the pathways of the Messiah and His Apostles, exploring the Hebraic origins of the faith, and carving away tradition as we discover the truth.